Worship is so much more than uh, we sometimes think it is. And uh, here at Shoreline, our mission statement is to help as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ. And uh, we've looked at, at uh, as many people as possible as organic outreach, becoming totally committed to discipleship, walking uh, in the ways of Jesus. And that last part, uh, just becoming totally committed to Jesus Christ, means that we do all these things pointing to Him. We do all these things to give God glory. You know, sometimes we think of worship as just the songs that we sing on Sunday, but it's so much more. I like to think of worship as um, really anything that honors God. When you're in your workplace and you're doing uh, the best that you can do, that honors God. And in fact, in the Bible it says, work for your masters as if you're working for God. So when you do that, you honor God, you're worshiping God. Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, he encourages us, brothers and sisters, uh, present your body as a living sacrifice. This is your true act of worship. And that has nothing to do with music, the songs we sing on Sundays, but it has to do with our everyday lives. When we excel at work and we do the best we can, we show others that we're working hard as unto God. That's worship. When we are uh, loving our families and, and showing our kids a great example of how to live, that's worship. When we're reaching out to others, when we're telling them about how much God loves them, spreading His good news, and that to Him is honoring and it's worship to God. As we uh, present ourselves as a living sacrifice, as worship, um, I feel like that's kind of the everyday life, um, it's our duty to God is how we live our lives. But uh, there's also a very profoundly deep, intimate aspect to worship. And you know, there's a reason that we start our Sunday mornings off or our times of uh, gathering together with music. We find in Psalm 100, it says, Worship the Lord with gladness. Sing a joyful song to Him. And uh, you know those things are tied together because God enjoys when His children come to Him and sing praises to Him. Whether it's through playing an instrument, through lifting your voice, uh, it's, it's all worship to God. And beyond uh, just the corporate gatherings of worship, I find in my own life that to go alone out into nature, for me, is uh, just an intimate experience with God. I can walk, I can pray to Him as I'm walking, I can behold His beauty that is all around and uh, thank Him for it. I can sit there for hours looking at the ocean or going on a hike and uh, it's just so enriching to my soul. I, I feel so much peace when I'm done, when I've been talking to God and uh, maybe playing my guitar on the beach or maybe just journaling and journaling my prayers. Uh, it's all worship to God. So when we at Shoreline talk about helping as many people as possible become totally committed to Jesus Christ, that last piece, we need to grow as worshipers. We need to glorify Jesus with every bit of our lives, whether it's doing our best in our everyday routines or whether it's taking some time to uh, go out into nature or go find a quiet place and be with God. I tell you, we have a worship pastor in John Ryan who doesn't just have great musical talents, he does. He doesn't just have a wonderful voice, he does. But he loves Jesus and his desire is to help us learn to worship God more. Aren't you thankful for a worship pastor like that? Yeah, I love it. I love it, yeah. Well, we're in week three of this deeper series and we're talking about what does it look like to go deeper, to go deeper in how we share the love of Jesus, to go deeper in how we walk with Jesus, to go deeper in how we give God glory and worship him and lift him up. And, and each week I've talked about this idea of the adventure, the beauty, the joy, and the excitement of faith and how it's discovered when we go deeper. Just like the ocean, you can stand on, a, you can stand on the shore or you can stand on a, the deck of a boat and look at the water and it's majestic, it's wonderful, but it's when you dive in. It's when you're in the water and you can see what's underneath. You go, man, this is beautiful. This is amazing. 
And no matter where you are in your faith, there's somewhere you can go that is going to be deeper if you'll dive in. And so week by week, we're looking at different areas of our mission statement and of our calling as a church, and we're talking about how do we go deeper. So, so the, the first picture that we have there is, is a picture of this, this new life, these little plants, and how we can go deeper into our community with the love of Jesus. And when we share his love and his grace and his message, people put their faith in Jesus. They're what the Bible calls, what Jesus said, born again, this new life, this new growth that happens. So that picture of, of reaching out and new people coming to know Jesus. Then last week we talked about going deeper in our walk with Jesus, those little feet. Just learning to walk more closely with Jesus, to follow him more passionately, to walk more in his ways so we look more like Jesus. It's called discipleship, spiritual growth. And we're going deeper into that. And today we're talking about going deeper into worship. Deeper in how, that picture, that arrow of lifting God up, of giving him glory, of praising him. Deeper into God's presence. What does that look like? How do we get there? How do we go deeper into the presence of the living God? And I'm absolutely convinced that it's a decision. It's a decision day by day and moment by moment. And I think in many ways, when it comes to this idea of worship, of worshiping God, I think in many ways we have it wrong. I think for many of us, when we think about worship, we think about this. I show up at church. I punch the worship clock. I'm here for an hour, hour and 10 minutes. Cha-chink punch out, and I'm done. I went to worship. I did the worship thing. And now I got the rest of the week for me. And when we think that way, we totally miss the concept of worship. It is so much bigger than that. So today we're going to talk about four different ways we can go deeper as worshipers. How we can dive deep so we can lift God up and give him glory. And the first one I think is the most important one because if we don't get this first idea, if we don't understand this first concept and live it out, we really can't do the other three. This is the foundation that it all sits on. So here's the first thing we can do to go deeper into God's presence, to go deeper as worshipers. Number one, we go deeper into God's presence when we make worship a lifestyle rather than an occasional break in the flow of our week. You want to go deeper in worship? Begin to see being a worshiper not as a thing you do for an hour a week or an hour once a month or an hour once every three months when you show up, but, but worship becomes who you are. It defines you. That worship permeates everything you do everywhere you go. Because that's what God has in mind. Now, God loves this when we gather together and worship him together. This is, delights the heart of God, and we'll talk about it a little bit later. But this makes more sense when we're worshipers out there in our lives, just as we walk through the normal stuff of a normal day, of a normal life. If you have your Bible, turn to Romans chapter 12. And the first two verses give this picture of worship that often gets missed because we think of it as singing or showing up here. And again, this is worship, but there's more to the story. So Romans 12, 1 and 2 sort of gives us this foundational understanding of worship. Verse 1, Romans 12. Therefore, I urge you, my brothers and my sisters, in view of God's mercy, understanding the great mercy of God, to offer your bodies, this is your whole life, your whole self, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, laying your whole life down. Offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper, what's the next word? Worship. This is your true and proper worship, offering your bodies, your whole life as a living sacrifice. And then the next verse. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed. It's a day-by-day, moment-by-moment transformation. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Your true and proper worship is offering your bodies, your life, all you are as a living sacrifice to God. And listen closely. That doesn't happen one hour a week. That doesn't happen when we're just together here. It happens moment by moment, day by day, in the flow of our ordinary lives. And what I can't do is I can't explain to you what it looks like for you to worship 24 hours a day as you're out there in the world. Because I don't know your life well enough to know. But here's what I can tell you. God wants you to meet him and worship him all day long, wherever you are. And when we get that kind of worship going on, then when we gather like this, this is a bonus. This is icing on the cake. And this is great but this is only an hour, hour and 10 minutes a week. 
So how are we living it out there? How do we make our lives a living sacrifice and give ourselves to God at that level? So what I'm going to be doing today is I'm going to be giving you a number of challenges, some some going deeper challenges. I had somebody say to me last week, man, I'm writing down all the challenges, but it's lots of challenges. It's going to be hard to do them all. I'm saying, don't try to do them all right now. Just pick one or two, you know, over and just say, here's my next step. You know, that, that last week, step by step, follow, what's my next step? What does God want? So, so one, or, one or two of these things today, let God speak to your heart and say, I'm going to work at this. I'm going to take a step to go deeper because the book of James says we're supposed to be doers of what God's word says, not just hearers. Oh, yeah, that's interesting. Great, and forget it. No, hear and let your life be changed. So, so we're called to offer our lives as a living sacrifice. So here's your deeper challenge. If, if worship is what you do all day long out there in the world, here's the challenge. Have... <coughs> Have some fun with worship. Get creative. Have fun. Identify three or four places, or start with one. You know, three or four places you don't normally think of worshiping. And have fun exploring how you can meet and glorify God in these places as part of your lifestyle. Think through your day. Think through your week. And say, where do I go and what do I do? And you're going to identify all kinds of things that are kind of like, oh, that's just that thing I do. And you say, God, can that become worship? Can I meet with the living God and glorify him while I do that? And I can think of all kinds of examples. I remember one, this is something that happened about seven years ago. Uh, Seven years ago, I came to Monterey to lead a leadership retreat for Shoreline Community Church. Pastor Howie, the founding pastor and the pastor at that time, called and said, can we fly in from Michigan? Will you spend a week and be with our leadership team and our our staff and and just lead a retreat for them? And it worked out for me to do it. I said, yeah, I'd love to come and do that. And he said, now listen, I know you like to golf. He said, bring your golf clubs. And the day before and the day afterwards, I'll set you up to go golfing somewhere. And so, because how he told me I had to, I did. So I brought my golf clubs. And, uh, and so the first day I got here, someone took me to Tehama up in the hills here. And this really, you know, hilly coast play. That was a lot of fun. And then the last day, how he says to me, okay, now today, you're going to go over to Monterey Peninsula Country Club. And there's a woman who's a member there who's going to take you golfing. And I said, well, you mean with a group? He said, no, just a woman from our church. I said, I can't do that. I can't go golfing just alone with a woman. And he said, when we had a crisis, I said, I just, I'm really crazy about boundaries. I said, I can't, I mean, I, I could, I'll spend time with my wife, with my sisters. At the time, my mom was living with my mom. But I won't, be, like, go out in public and hang out, have a date with another woman. You know, it just doesn't work that way. And he, so he said to me, he says, well, he said, this person, he said, he, said, he, he just kind of thought, he says, well, he said, she actually... And he tried to put it in perspective. He said, she actually traveled with Bob Hope on the USO tours during the Korean War as a singer. And he was saying, she you know, could be your mother. He was saying, you know, he was putting it in perspective, right? Uh, so I thought, I said, okay. So I called my wife. I said, I'm going to call my wife and get permission anyways, right? So I called my wife. I did. I called Sherry and I said, you know, there's this, this woman and I'm supposed to go golfing with her. It's just the two of us. But I kind of gave the story. She goes, oh, that's fine. So I go to Monterey Peninsula Country Club and I meet Patrice Glethro. And uh, since then, Patrice has become a dear friend of our family. She mentors Sherry. They pray together. She's an encourager. And we, you know, dear friends. We meet to go golfing. And we're standing on the first tee. And I asked her this question. I said, Patrice, what do you love? I said, what do you love? And she looked at me and she said, I love to pray. She said, I love to pray. So I said, I got an idea. On all the par fives, and if you're not a golfer, par fives are the long holes that take longer to play. Um, the first hole is a par five. We're on the shore course. So, so I said, on all the par fives, on the tee, we'll pick a topic to pray about. And after we hit our balls, we'll just walk along together and we'll pray together. And so we did it on all the par fives. Each, each tee, we'd, we'd pick a topic. Remember one of the topics, she said, I want to pray for the women's ministry at Shoreline Church, which my wife ended up later leading for a couple of years. And uh, so we prayed for that. And we just prayed as we walked. And then we'd get to our ball, we'd stop praying, we'd take a shot, and then keep walking and keep praying. And, and here's what I found out that being out on the golf course can become an act of worship. Now, God gets mentioned on the golf course periodically, um, <laughs> but it's not always in a good way, right? And so we, we took a walk and we prayed. And you say, well, you, you might go, well, that's easy. I mean, you're on a golf course, it's beautiful, it's gra- you know, green and grassy and trees. You know, that's easy. You know, well, how about this? So, so now we're gonna have fun with worship and you're gonna look at your life and pick something that doesn't feel worshipful most of the time and you're going to try to make it worship. So try this one on. You're a parent, and you have a newborn, and you're getting ready to change the 1,427th diaper this week. And, uh, you're, you're, and so you're, you're, you're cha- you're, how, can, can changing a diaper become a moment of worship? Well, you have to think about it. You have to get creative. Okay, so you're like, okay, Lord, I want to thank you right now that my child's digestive system works 
really well. And really, you know, whatever it is, you, know, you start thanking God and you start praying and you start, and thank you for these little fingers and thank you, but you, and you make it a moment of worship. I remember when I became a Christian, I was, I was almost 16 years old. And at 16, I got my first job. I'd worked before working at 7-Eleven stocking the cooler, but I wasn't 16 yet. My first real job was at, at Carl's Jr. And as a new employee, there was one of the jobs that nobody wanted because they gave it to the newest worker until they had a new newest worker. And it was cleaning the floor drains. The floor drains were these little square porcelain white drains that were sort of half under the cabinetry and half out. And all of the gunk would be you know, swept or mopped into them all day long. At the end of the day, they had to be cleaned every single day. So as a new person, I got to clean the floor drains. And I remember saying to God, okay, God, how do I make this a worship to you? Cleaning floor drains. I thought it works out kind of well because the only way you can clean them is getting on your knees. So I thought, okay, I'm on my knees anyways. And the word worship actually means to bow down. So I thought, okay, I'm partly there, you know? And instead of going, I hate this, this is stupid, I can't wait till somebody else works here, I, I seriously, I started saying, God, I want to wash these like these are your floor drains. I want them to sparkle and shine. And I, just, and I just tried, and it was hard. I mean, it wasn't like I'm going, woo, this is great. It was, it was you know, but, but I remember kneeling there on the ground, cleaning his floor drains and saying, God, can this become an act of worship? And there's a wonderful little book. If you ever want to read just a real small book, just do a search online. You can buy it online. You can get used copies for next to nothing. A little book called Practicing the Presence of God by a guy named Brother Lawrence. Uh, brother Lawrence was a, was a, was a brother. He wasn't, he wasn't a priest, but he would cook food for the priest. He was a brother, and he would, cook food and do dishes all day long. Once you, you know, cook all day long, do, you know, uh, serve the meal, do dishes afterwards and start cooking for the next meal. And this little book, Practicing the Presence of God, what he talks about there is, is how, how he learned to make washing every single dish an act of worship to God. And how he met God in just like breathing in the moments of the day. I want to challenge you to look at your life and have fun picking things that look like, I don't, I've never really thought about worshiping in, in the middle of a meeting that's difficult and challenging. How does that become worship? But, but can I meet God there? Can I invite God in? Can I experience God's presence in the midst of whatever I'm going through? And, and maybe you look at your life and you say, well, here's this thing I'm involved in, this thing I'm doing, and I can't find any, I mean, I've tried, I can't find any possible way that I could even invite God to be involved in this or even acknowledge that God's there. I just can't find any way for this to be worship. If you have something in your life that you just can't find any possible way for God to be involved in, you might ask yourself what kind of question. Something like, why am I doing this? Should I be doing this, right? But I'd be careful not to write things off too quickly because you'd be amazed at how God can meet you in the strangest of places. I've got a buddy who's a pastor in another country, and we have a monthly meeting that we have, a Skype meeting. We get on, on our computers, and we can talk and see each other, and we have a meeting. We just talk together and pray together and encourage each other in our ministry, <clears throat> and he shared with me a few weeks ago the situation uh, that was a praise but a challenge. It's about somebody who was trying to figure out if they could glorify God in their work. He said, there's a woman that my wife and I have been reaching out to, we've been praying for week one, organic outreach, they've been praying for, reaching out to this woman that they knew, and he said she became a Christian. She was coming to their growth group in their home, their growth group, not a Christian, gave her heart to Jesus, became a follower of Jesus Christ, confessed her sin, acknowledged Jesus, acknowledged Jesus, lived, died, and rose again, received Jesus. She's a Christian. And so she came to him and she said, you know, th here's the challenge I have right now. I'm trying to figure out if I can keep doing my job, if I can stay with my same career. And I'm trying to figure out if, I, if God can be part of what I do. Here's her job. She's the head of safety and kind of cleanliness for the sex workers in her country because prostitution is legal there, fully legal. And her job is a, a high-level government job where safety and cleanliness within these brothels, within these places of prostitution for men and women, that's her job. And she's asking the question, can I glorify Jesus when I'm here in this? And, and you know, your first thought might be, of course not. But she's trying to figure, she's saying, she, she's saying, there's so much darkness there that if I leave now, do I take away the little bit of light that might be there? And maybe God could use me to touch the lives of these men and women who are living this kind of a life. She's trying to figure out, does God want me to stay there? And I can't answer that for her. You might think you can, but I don't think I can. She has to seek the face of God. This is the, the amazing part about walking with Jesus. She has to say, God, do you want me here? Am I here for a reason? And can I stay and bring the light of Jesus to a very dark place? Or God might say to her, you know what? For who you are and what's going on in your life, this is just gonna be too oppressive for you and you need to, I don't, I don't know. But could we live our lives like that? Where each, each thing we do, we say, God, can I meet you here? Can I, can I glorify you in this? 
can I follow you and, 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 and give you glory in this place, in this situation? And figure, look at every area of your life, and especially think of those areas that you just think, God, I don't know if there's any way, any way that you could glorify God, and find out. You might discover there's a way to glorify God in the strangest of places. So number one, we go deeper into God's presence when we make worship a lifestyle rather than an occasional break in the flow of our week. If we get this right, if we get this right, then all we do all week long is worshiping God. Then when we gather together like this, man, you're ready to worship. Why? You've been worshiping all week long. Now you just get to do it with a bunch of people who love Jesus or people who are trying to figure out who Jesus is. You know, this is, fun. This is like a bonus. This is amazing. And you take delight in this. But, but I think that worshiping God here gathered only really makes sense when we learn to worship God out there scattered in all that we do. And if we're living to worship God on, on, a, on a golf course, cleaning floor drains, changing diapers, in challenging meetings, wherever it is, if we're living for God and worshiping him, him there, then this makes way more sense. So begin in the flow of your life. We're only here together for a short time a week, but worship God through the flow of your life. It's like breathing. It's part of what you do. But here's the second thing. Number two, we go deeper into God's presence when we make a decision to worship with God's people on a weekly basis. I think this is biblical and very important. God made the heavens and the earth six days and then he rested. There's a rhythm to our souls. There's a rhythm to our lives. And if you're a follower of Jesus, we work, we labor, we live out there worshiping God and all those things. But there's a day each week that God invites us together to, to be reinvigorated, to be challenged, to be filled in a fresh way. It's not just this. It's all of that. But it's this too. And I, I think we go, we go deeper in worship when we say as a rhythm to life, we're gonna gather together with God's people and give him glory as a congregation. In Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 25, it talks about this. I'm gonna look at two verses, verses 24 and 25 in Hebrews chapter 10. And the writer of Hebrews gives this really strong challenge. It says, let us consider how we may spur one another on. That spur like a, you know, with a horse spurs, you're moving, you're challenging, giddy up, move it along, challenge each other. Let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. And here's a warning. Not giving up meeting together. Not getting, giving up this. As some are in the habit of doing. Some people get in a rhythm of life where they, well, I'll gather with God's people for worship, you know, once a month, once a quarter, Christmas and Easter. You know, but, but not that regular rhythm. And he's saying, let's challenge each other to not do that. And all the more as you see the day approaching. He says it's going to be more and more important to gather like this and worship, scattered for worship, but it's more and more important to gather the closer we come to the end of time, to the second coming of Jesus. I'm going to tell you right now when Jesus is going to come again. You ready? One day sooner than it was yesterday. I know that for sure. I'm not going to guess any past that, okay? Some people write books, guess that, but I don't guess that because Jesus said no one knows the time or the hour. I'm not going to guess, but I'm going to tell you this. Today's one closer, day closer than it was yesterday, and tomorrow will be one day closer again. And with each passing day, this becomes more important because this fills us and encourages us and lets us know we're not alone. Whether you're a longtime Christian, a new believer, or you're just trying to kind of figure out the Christian faith, understand there's lots of people who love Jesus. And we worship out there in the world, and that's a challenging thing at times. But man, whew, boy, to come together with God's people in the rhythm of your week, for God's glory and for the good of your soul is so, so, so important. So here's your challenge. Here's your deeper challenge. Commit to gather with God's people for worship every week for two months. I'm gonna challenge you for the next two months to gather for worship every single week. If you don't like you know, crowds and if you don't like parking things, we have a service at 8.30. There's more room than there is in this one. And we have a service at 11.30. 8.30, 11.30, 10 o'clock. And so, but I want to challenge you for the next two months, every week, gather for worship. So, so don't let anything get in the way. And so here's my challenge. If you are a, come to Sunday morning services normally and you have something come up on the weekend, you've got a, an event, a, something that you've got to be part of, sports thing with your kids, whatever it is, come to worship on Monday night. You, say, you have a Monday night service? Yes, we, no, we, I don't, we do. God's people gather here in the Parkside room every Monday night. We have a worship band that leads music. We have a pastor, Pastor Tom, who hosts that service. So if you can't make it on a Sunday morning for the next eight weeks, say, then I'm going to come on Monday evening and, and come to that service. 
and worship with God's people there. We have children's programming that goes on. Bring your kids along. Here's the only thing I gotta tell you. We don't do bagels and donuts and coffee. Okay, you're not gonna get that. On Monday nights, we have bread bowls, chili, and clam chowder. Seriously, you're like, what? I'd have been going Monday nights years ago. Are you kidding me? No, and it's a free, we don't do a free breakfast on Monday nights. We do a free dinner. Well, it's free in the sense that you all pay for it with your offerings. But anyways, um, but, but we, we have fellowship around food, and then we have a great worship service. And I'm going to look at the camera for a minute, and the camera, so Monday night, most of the service on Monday night, they, watch, they have live music, then they watch the video from Sunday morning. Sometimes they preach live. But on Monday nights, I want to let you all know, we have services at Shoreline on Sunday mornings. So everyone here at Shoreline, say, say, tell them, say welcome. One, two, three. Welcome. So if you can't make it on Monday night, We'll make room for you. Come on a Sunday morning because we do this on Sunday mornings three times, okay? So you come join us on a Sunday morning. We'll come join you on a Monday because we're all part of the same church. And if you can't do either of those, my challenge would be then go to the online option. Make that a last resort. But go online and watch the sermon. So if you missed last week, don't just come and kind of jump in the middle of it. Watch last week's sermon and get yourself caught up a little bit. And if you're traveling and you're somewhere else, go to church where you are. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm traveling. I'm not going to find a church. Call in advance or go on their website and read their statement of faith. Make sure they actually believe in Jesus and the Bible. You know, make sure it's a Christian church. Um, but other than that, just go and hang out. You might say, well, it's a real small church and they sing hymns out of hymn books. And sort of thing. Have fun. That's, that's your family. You're going to be in heaven forever with them. Why not get to know them now? So go. And some of you right now are here because you're doing that. Some of you live somewhere else and you're here for the weekend and you're hanging out with us. We're, thank you. You're living this stuff out already. But this is part of the rhythm. For eight weeks, will you try a rhythm of gathering for worship with God's people? I really believe that God's designed us to both give him glory because he desires that, but also he's designed us to be filled and encouraged. That's your challenge. Eight weeks. Every week for eight weeks. Be here on a Sunday morning or Sunday evening. If you're traveling, go to church somewhere. Or last resort, follow online and make sure you stay caught up and see if that helps in you going deeper as a worshiper. Number three. We go deeper into God's presence when we are open to the experience, the presence, the power, and the work of the Holy Spirit of God. When Jesus left this planet, he said to his followers, it's better for you that I'm going away. He says, it's better than I am because when he walked on this earth as a man, he could be in one place at one time. But he said, but I'm gonna come back and be with you and be in you. The very spirit of God, the spirit of Jesus dwells in us if we're followers of Jesus. And so we ask, spirit of God, Move in my life. When you worship out there and when you worship in here, will you say, Spirit of God, teach, speak, challenge, do what you want to do. In John chapter four, Jesus, there's this long interaction of Jesus with this woman at this well in the city of Samaria. And they have this conversation about a number of things, but they talk about worship. And they, back then, the Samaritans, the Jews, debated what was the right place to worship, what was the right way to worship. The same silly stuff people debate today. But Jesus kind of strips it right down. And here's what he says. In John 4, 23, Jesus says, and yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father, what's the next word? Seeks. God is seeking worshipers who worship in him in spirit and in truth. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. When you gather like this for worship, when you say, Spirit of God, join us, meet us, speak to me. When you're out there walking through your life of worship, will you say, Spirit of God, lead me, open my eyes, help me encounter the very presence of God right where you've put me this day and at this moment. So here's your deeper challenge. And, and, and this, is, this is just so important. Each time you gather with God's people for a time of corporate worship like this, or when you're out there walking through your life, invite the Holy Spirit of the living God to move in you, to teach, to convict, to challenge, to fill you? Will you ask God, oh, spirit of the living God, meet me and work in me as I worship out there, but also as we worship together here, as you walk into this room on a Sunday morning, as, as you walk in on Monday evening to the Parkside room, as you walk into the, to the, to the cafe where we have a group worshiping right now, as you walk into the family worship venue, we're in four different venues here on our campus right now, as you walk into whatever setting you're in, will you pray for that space and say, God, fill this place with your Holy Spirit. And each person who walks in here, will you touch our hearts by your Holy Spirit, by the very Spirit of the living God. Fill us. And then would you dare to pray something like this, Spirit of God, if what needs to happen today in my life, when I gather like this for worship, if what I need is to be challenged and convicted, 
God, let me have it. And God, if what I need is to be encouraged and blessed and lift up, then God, lift me up by your spirit. But God, do what you want to do. Invite God by his spirit to work in you and then push out and say, God, I want to pray that people sitting around me will be met by your spirit. I want to pray that the balcony people will meet the Holy Spirit. I want to pray that the people on the main floor will meet the Holy Spirit. I want to pray, if you're in here, pray for the Parkside Room and pray for the cafe and, and, and pray for the family worship venue and over in the, in the Pacific Room and, pr- and pray for the students that are upstairs meeting, middle school and high school kids, that God will meet them by his Holy Spirit. We're called to worship God in spirit and in truth. So will you invite the Holy Spirit to move and to work, do whatever he wants to do? And then finally, number four, when we go deeper into God's presence, we'll go deeper and deeper and deeper when we not only show up to a worship service, but fully engage in each part of the worship experience with authentic hearts of praise. It is possible to show up like this together, to go through the motions, and to really not meet with God. There's, there's this, this little passage in Isaiah chapter 29 where God is speaking and he says this. He says, these people come near to me with their mouth And they honor me with their lips, with what they say. But their hearts are far from me. Their worship of me is based on merely human rules they've been taught. What God is saying is sometimes we can go through religious routines, but not actually meet God and worship. So let's be careful that we don't do that. Let's, get, let, let, let's worship authentically in a truthful, honest way. So, so again, this John 4 passage, I read it a moment ago. I want to read it one more time. And I want you to notice worship in spirit, but also the other thing is in truth. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. This is authenticity, honesty, in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father, what's it say? Seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in the spirit and in truth. Will will, will you engage authentically when we gather together like this? Will you check yourself and make sure you're not just going through religious motions? Well, I showed up, punched the clock, I'm out of here. But are you meeting with God? Are you asking him to move within you? So, So how do we engage? How do we fully engage? And what might this look like as we gather together like this? I mean, we talked first about worshiping out there. But as we gather like this, what are some ways we can engage? Here's one thing. Before the service, prepare yourself. As you're driving over, as you're riding your bike over, as you're getting a taxi, as you're walking here, whatever it is, you're getting a bus to come here. You know, as you're on your way, say, God, prepare me to meet you. God, I pray for those that will lead worship and song. I pray for those that will be greeting. I pray for our ushers. I pray for the people in the park. And just pray that we may meet with you. But God, prepare my heart to meet with you. Because God, I want to see your face. I need to see your face. I need to experience your presence and prepare your heart. I remember for 14 years when we lived in Michigan, I would always go to church early in the morning. I'd go really early and and Sherry would come a little bit later with the boys. So on the drive, it was like a seven minute drive from our house to the church. But Sherry and the boys, every single Sunday for 14 years on the drive over, they'd pray together out loud. Part of the way she taught our boys to pray was praying as they were driving over to church. But by the time they got there, They were already praying for their Sunday school teachers and they were praying for the service and they were praying for their dad who was gonna be preaching. How do you use that time coming over to church? Are you preparing yourself? When you come into this room, just kind of say, okay, Lord, it's been a crazy week. Just let my heart be ready. Let me meet with you. Let me encounter you. Prepare yourself. And then fellowship. Connect with the people around you. If we're gathering for corporate worship like God has called us to, not giving up and missing the habit of being together, but we're doing this, then why show up Sing the songs, hear a sermon, say a prayer, and buzz out of here and not even acknowledge anybody else is here. Let's interact with each other. So just say, when I, I'm gonna come a minute earlier and stay two or three minutes later. I'm gonna, somebody I shook hands with, I'm gonna say, hey, I don't know if I've met you. And you're gonna chat with them and talk with them and actually engage with people and make eye contact and interact. I wanna encourage you to, that's called fellowship, being with God's people. And so I encourage you to consider that and try to engage more with the people around you. Singing. Sing with passion from your heart. I mean, sing passionately, deeply. You want to like my voice. God does. He made it, right? Sing to him. Praise him. Think about what the words mean. Some of you say, I don't even sing. I don't like singing. When I became a Christian, I didn't like singing. When I've been a Christian for like a year, year and a half, I still didn't like singing. But I started singing because I read in the Bible that God kept saying, sing a song, sing a song, sing a new song, sing a song. I'm like, okay. And so I started singing. And, and I've grown to love it. Really. 
But, but so try. Some of you, maybe that, that's your next step. That's your deeper is, okay, I'll sing. God, okay. I'll, won't be very loud, but I'm going to start. You know, and move your lips, but move your heart. And it'll move the heart of God. Prayers. Join in prayer. Pastor Steve led us in prayer today, a beautiful prayer. And were you just listening to his prayer? Were you making a shopping list? Were you thinking about you going to lunch later? Pray. When, when we pray, pray. I'm going to close in prayer shortly. Pray with me. We're not praying just you know, kind of on your behalf. We're praying together. Join your heart in prayer. Giving. Give joyfully. Give generously. Whether you give online or whether you give once a month or once a week. Every time the plate goes by during that giving back time, just say, God, I give you my life, a living sacrifice, all that I am. And yeah, I give some offering too, but God, I want to just, I want to give you everything. Let it be a time to give yourself to the Lord. During the preaching, to listen, to pay attention. If it helps to bring your Bible along, to follow along, to take notes, if that helps you, but to say, God, I don't want to just hear what we talked about. I want to see it change my life. So God's word becomes powerful in your heart and in your soul. And then afterwards, when you go out from here, understand that now, it's not like, okay, now I'm done worshiping for the week. You leave here going, I'm just getting started. I'm just getting warmed up. Now I'm all fired up and I'm gonna go worship while I change diapers and while I clean floor, floor drains and while I'm in meetings and while I'm golfing or jogging. I'm gonna figure out how to worship everywhere I go, with every dish I wash, with every breath I take. Because there is a God who seeks, seeks people who worship him in spirit and in truth led by the Holy Spirit with honest hearts. Sometimes the honest thing is to say, God, I feel far from you. I, my, my heart feels dusty and dry, but oh God, I want to experience your presence. He'll hear a prayer like that. And so we, when, we, when we finish here, we're just getting warmed up to go out and worship out there, wherever God sends us. And as I was thinking about this, I was, thinking, I was getting this picture in my mind, and you know if you've heard me preach many times, I'm always, I think in pictures and illustrations and props and stuff, it's just the way my brain works. And I was thinking about how, how we each bring our own kind of worship, and we each kind of, you know, some people, you know, I love to sing, and they have a great voice. Some people say, I don't have a great voice, but God loves it all. And I was thinking about a friend of mine, Joel. There's a, a painting that we have. It's a, it's a watercolor of the lion and the lamb, and, and Joel, uh, this is an original one, and he actually... Uh, does like pictures of animals and Bible stories and then he'll do children's versions and then a grown-up version kind of thing and he puts them on top of each other. It's really beautiful, creative artwork and people pay thousands of dollars for his paintings. And, uh, and, and so you, know, you say, well, you get something like that. Somebody would buy that. They'd put it on their wall. They'd pay money for it. You'd put it in a gallery. You know, it's beautiful work. And you say, but what I, you know, some people's worship, they just, it's so beautiful. God might like that, but he doesn't like mine. Sometimes, you know, maybe, so you have a five-year-old say, well, I'm gonna draw a picture of a lion too. And it looks like that. And that's the kind of thing that a five-year-old might draw or a lead pastor. Um, and um, <laughs> with a lot of time, really working hard, so stop laughing. No, but, uh, um, and you go, but nobody's paying money for that. Nobody's putting in a gallery down in Carmel and getting lots of money for that, right? The only one that would take that and put it on their refrigerator is dad or mom. And your worship, sometimes you say, I don't do it very well. I don't sing very well. I don't know. I, don't, I can't give a whole lot. It really, it, it's just a little kid's version. And God says, yeah, but you're my kid. You're my daughter. You're my son. And you give me the best you have. And I put it right on my refrigerator. I say, that's beautiful. I love it. So proud of you. I love you. He seeks that. The God of heaven Wants our worship, yes. Like this together, out there scattered. And I just had this picture come to my mind again. It's just, my, just in my brain. I just had this picture kind of this morning as I was thinking about this message and as I was praying to come and preach the word today. And there's a picture of each of us who's put their faith in Jesus. One day when this life ends, going to heaven and walking into to God's big mansion and walking around to find the kitchen, because you always heard about if God, you know, you're his child, God would put your stuff on his refrigerator, and you go through the kitchen, and you go to the refrigerator, and there's all these pictures and things, and you're looking, you're looking, you're looking, and there's nothing that you drew or did or prayed or praised on his refrigerator. And you go, well, God, that's not encouraging. And you start walking around, and then you walk into the living room. There's a big fireplace, the roaring fire, and there's a mantle, and above the mantle is this big frame with this collage of all your prayers and all your praises all the paintings you drew for God. And you stand there looking at it. You go, that's all my stuff. And you feel the arm of Jesus come around you. He stands next to you and he says, that's some of my favorites. That's some of my favorites. God loves you. And he seeks your worship. And sometimes you don't give it to him because you think it's not good enough. But just start where you are. 
and then go deeper. And God will take delight as you worship him out there and as you worship him in here. Let's pray together. Oh, Jesus, we come before you. And we don't always know how to do the perfect prayers and don't know if our voice is always just right. And even as we walk through our days, we probably miss a lot of opportunities to worship you and give you praise in the flow of our day. But God, would you hear our prayer? We who know you, oh God, through faith in Jesus, we who have become the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit of God in us, will you take us deeper as worshipers? Will you teach us to just give you what we have as best we can? Would you make our lives a living sacrifice of praise to you? God, you seek those who will worship you in spirit and truth. May you find those people here in this room and scattered all over this world in the coming week. Teach us to worship you in deeper ways for your glory, O God, and for our good. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to invite the uh, pastors in all of our venues right now just to share a few closing words in your venue. And God bless you. They'll share a few words with you. And right here in the worship center.